factually the sister church of Charleston, the same founder created both churches. But more than that, many of you are my heart sisters, and I love coming. We, we, we started a relationship, whether you know it or not, four or five years ago. And uh, I would run away and come up here as often as I could. And many, many of the women here and some of the guys have been in C classes with us. We've been together at Canuga, and I snuck my way into your cabin. And, um, so I keep, you know, kind of talking to my husband, don't you want to move to Myrtle Beach? <laughs> so, and not yet. But anyway, so, um, so I'm thrilled to be here. And even with all those connections and all the love that I see here, I had bad dreams last night about coming and speaking. So I'll share those with you because my world talks to me in my dreams, as many of you all also do. So I was here, and I was trying to get ready, and I was naked. You know that one, you know, where you're trying to talk, and, you know, you're on the school bus naked, and you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that was my first dream of the night is I couldn't find anywhere privately to dress and I'm running around naked. Okay? I probably should have just dressed wherever I was, right? Well, I was not looking for, you know, a room with a door. So my next one is I'm here, but my clothes are sheer. And I'm standing up here and it's completely sheer and I'm like, okay, I didn't do that well. My third dream is I was up here and I had covered myself with a scarf and I was ready to go. So I, I prepared for this all night long. <laughs> and here I am. So, um, I, as you know, I was at the Village a lot last year to get uh, finish my LUT. And in one of the classes, they teach you about giving a message. And one of the things I was told was to always start with a joke. So here it is. <laughs> How do you make holy water? You put tap water in a pot and boil the hell out of it. <laughs> okay, that's corny, but it's on topic, okay? <laughs> so today we're going to be exploring the idea of holy. And the first time I heard that word and how, how that word has changed meaning for me along and along my life. So this, unfortunately, the way that I can tell that is to tell you my story. So just hang on, and hopefully it will resonate with your story as well. So the first time I heard that word, I was about five years old, sitting in a wooden pew, and the Sunday school teacher was talking about Moses and the burning bush, and that he had to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. And you know how your consciousness or spirit, God or universe kind of gives you these little bits of things to remember. It's sort of like a foreshadowing, you know? And I knew I wanted to hold that concept. I knew at five years old that was going to be important to me. And I remember, well, I always did love to be barefoot. But then I could say to my mom, but it's holy, I get to be barefoot, I'm holy. <laughs> but, um, but it really crystallized something in me that made me understand things a little differently. That little church, I learned it was Garrett Chapel Methodist Church. And there were all 18 of us in there. In the, the bosom of the hills of Kentucky. And I didn't know until later that we were actually a renegade church. That that church was told, you're so small, you either merge with this other church or we're not going to supply you a minister anymore. And being the good little rebels that we were, we said, we're going out on our own. <laughs> well, what that meant is we didn't have a minister. And anyone who heard the call could get in front of these 18 people and say whatever they wanted to say. And um, it was uh, interesting, uh, enlightening. Some people could read, some people couldn't. Some people just thumped the Bible and never opened it. <coughs> But they, they loved God. They had a passion for God. They loved God. And they were learning, you know, just like we were learning and all. And it wasn't an evangelical church. You know, it was about love and God the Father and all that. So it was pretty good. But it was, just to give you a clue, it was one room, no bathroom. Well, there was bathroom. It was outside. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, so it was just one room. And, and uh, the children would meet in the first pew with Miss Virginia Bannon. 
who also played the piano, took up the money, sang the solos, and taught all the children. <laughs> <laughs> I love Virginia Fannin, Miss Fannin. Um, and she had a children's Bible story book, and it had beautiful pictures in it, and I'm an artist, and so I was always drawn to pictures of art and things in there, the beautiful faces and angels and all that. And she would, you know, I was there, what, you know, 16 years. So she'd get to the end of the book and go back to chapter one, you know. And so by the end, it became a little Montessori school where the older children read to the younger children and all that. And we formed a little leadership skill. So it was good. It was really good. But when I got home, my dad, who did not go to church with us, would sit me down and say, what did they tell you? <laughs> and that was, I, I don't know if he ever knew, he has passed now, I don't know if he ever knew the gift he gave me of giving me that power because he not only said, what did they tell you? He said, did you believe it? What would you think? Wow. Six years old, sitting on the couch. What would you think? I became a theologian in first grade. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And he never really said what he believed. It was important what I thought. And he would just ask questions and say, well, show me. Show me in the Bible. You know, it's such a gift. And that's where my journey to this place right now in front of this microphone right there started was with my dad. And all of the varying ideas that were presented to me at Garrett Chapel, you know, that's for sure. Um, as for the rest of the household, my sisters and my mom, they were very, um, you know, we did nighttime prayers and meal blessings and sang hymns in the car and all that. And so my first experience, really, about God and my understanding of God, that he was a very magical kind of Santa Claus. You ask for things, and he would bless you with things, and you were thankful, and you know, it's a sweet child's perspective that I think many of us start, at least I hope that's how you started out with this, you know, loving God. But I guess the takeaway, which I still hold today, is that God loves us and wants us to have what we need. God wants us to be blessed. You know, um, I remember some of the stories from the children's book. It was magical. It was you know, Jonah and the whale, and Moses in the burning bush, and water into wine, and creation. Creation. It was magical. And so for me, it was like a magical Santa Claus. But because of the creation story, I got that God was all entwined with nature. And that was my dad's church. We had 100 acres. And that was his church. And he'd say, come walk with me. Come walk with me. And we would just walk and not talk. You know, he just said, come on with me. And we would commune with 100 acres of trees and forest and creek and, and cows and, you know, all kinds of things. Lots of squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was my dad's holy ground. You know? But the story of all those that held the most reverence for me was that story I said about Moses in the burning bush. Do you remember it? Okay, so he had left Egypt as a murderer. He had gone into exile. And he um, met a woman, as we all do. We met a man, we met a woman. And he created a life as a shepherd for his father-in-law. And so he's out. And when they talk about being a shepherd, they mean they took him out for a month and came back. You know, so he was on this big journey. And... Now, Horeb was there, and he saw a light up there that he wanted to go see what was going on. So he goes up there, and it's a bush that is burning but is not consumed. And from the bush, he hears, take off your shoes, for you are on holy ground. And there he meets the face of God. Well, that's pretty exciting to a kid. Because I hadn't heard any stories about God and humankind meeting since the Garden of Eden. So, you know, just that, that started my mind spinning. Because what God said was that there was a job for him. That he was to go back and free the slaves of Egypt, his people, the Jewish people. And then I got to thinking, well, 
maybe we've all got jobs to do. Maybe we're supposed to be, you know, figuring out what God wants us to do. I just remember that Spirit saying, listen, this is for you. This story, this is for you. So then in my childhood, I was there in my teenage years, the First Baptist Church on Main Street had the best youth program. They poured money and time and energy and all kinds of things into the best youth programs. And all my friends said, you have to go, you have to go. They show movies, they show, you know, they have parties for us, we take trips and all that kind of stuff. So I said, okay, you know, I, I know Virginia Bandit's book, I'll go over here. <laughs> so I went to the youth program because my friends did. And I, people were loving and kind and like I said, they poured so much attention into the youth that I felt like I was a big part of the community. But there was a lot of talk about sin. And there was a lot of talk about hell. And I had not had that before in my little tiny church that everybody just loved each other and they were all neighbors, you know? And I thought that doesn't fit with this loving God that I know from growing up, you know, in my little church. And I especially couldn't um, resonate with the idea of the role of women in that church. Who, you know, I couldn't even take up the offering because I was a girl. And so I said, whoop, gotta go. Because <laughs> I like microphones too. <laughs> they certainly would not have given me a microphone. I had a hard time getting the microphone here. <laughs> so um, from there, they tried to teach me that God judges and God punishes. And what I really learned is God impassions from them. They were very passionate and they gave a lot of money and they gave a lot of energy and a lot of time. So I walked away with the God is love and God in passion. So y'all can just keep the rest of all that stuff. <laughs> but I also learned from them that there is a responsible response to God's love. It's not free. Right? It wasn't bought and paid for through Jesus Christ. But to get more of it, you have to be in vibe with it. And that's what I mean, it's not free. You can't just do whatever you want and have that divineness empowering and passionless. So I learned that there is a response, there is a way to do this better and to get more of the divine. So I learned that from them. Um, so I went to college and I vowed to go to every church that would let me in the door. <laughs> and in Kentucky, it was, uh, it was not a lot of diversity. There weren't any Sikhs or anything like that. But, which I now go and say, hey, what are they doing? But um, I went to a temple. I went to high church, low church, holy rolling church. Um, I went to Catholic mass. I even learned about Allah from students that called themselves Persian because it was during the Iran hostage situation in the 80s. Um, but I would sit and talk with them in the cafeteria. Tell me, why is that on your head? You know, it's like I knew nothing, and, and I wanted to know. And so I had a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And you know what I saw? I saw people just like me seeking communion with each other. That's what I saw. And they wanted holy ground. They wanted sacredness. They wanted to know that in themselves and they wanted to know that in others. People were seeking to see the face of God that Moses had seen. And people were wanting to know that God. They came together to be better, to do better, to learn more, to open that place inside of themselves that gives them a fresh start every day, that helps them be the co-creators of their life, just like we do every Sunday. And I am so thankful that we have the opportunity to do that together in love. Here in Charleston, in every, every gathering place, whatever name is over the door, doesn't matter. So I learned from all that visited around that 
God calls us to know him deeply, to experience him. In my 20s, I married a cradle-born Presbyterian. I mean, like centuries-old cradle Presbyterian. Um, they came in the port at Charleston from the old country. Um, and so they'd given the land for the local Presbyterian church. That's where our family cemetery is. I'm talking cradle Presbyterian. And he said, I'll go to church as a family when we have kids. If you go to Presbyterian church, sure, I'll be everywhere else. Let's go there. <laughs> You know, um, so we went, and it was good. It was good for me because they were very educated. They were very academic. They knew the context and the history of those stories from those children, that children's Bible. And they wanted you to learn. There were classes, and everybody that taught had degrees and, and all that. And that was a different experience for me. And it was very good for me because I... I did learn the depth of religion and how long we've been seeking and all those things and how we have changed in our seeking. And so it was very good to learn all that and the meaning behind things. And, and I thought I gained an intellectual understanding of spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> they would laugh. You guys laugh, right? They wouldn't laugh. They think that's how you do it. So after a while... I was um, dead, dry, you know, I wasn't filled, I, my head was full, but ask me anything, you know, I can tell you anything, and I felt like a college professor or something, and I was empty, I was empty, so I started reading all the books that probably are in your bookstore, because when I first went to the Unity Bookstore, I walked in and said, I've read all these books. I didn't know there was a church that had all those books. But I swear to you, as God leads, my higher spirit leads, I walk through Goodwill, a book would go, bye! And I'd take it home and read it and go, oh, yeah, I needed that book. But I was led because I was open, and I was seeking, and I was searching. And so I was guided. And so I started uh, meditating. And then I met a lady that did Reiki, and I started Reiki practice. And I'm master level Reiki person now. And so I started on Tuesday night, the Unity of Charleston has a Reiki clinic. And somebody said, you want to go down there? You know, you're like, okay, I'll go. And so I was doing that for a while, and I wasn't telling anybody, not my husband, <laughs> nobody knew that I was doing this weird Reiki thing. And so the Unity Church has all of the different symbols of the world religions around the top of it in our church. And I thought, oh my God, I've been there, I've been there, yeah, I like that, you know. And then I thought, and I was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, head of the Christian Education Department, blah, 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 you know, all that. So um, on Sundays, I would somehow manage to run off to the Unity Church. I told Charlene I called Unity my mistress. <laughs> Nobody knew. <laughs> and it was a couple of years that Unity was my mistress. I, I ended the, the elder, you know, active elder thing at Presbyterian Church, and then I just sat my husband down and said, Look, I stepped out. <laughs> and, uh, and he wasn't even going anymore because the kids were bigger. You know, he'd done his time. You know, he wasn't even in church time. So, um, and I, he said, well, I'm going to go one time, just make sure it's not a cult. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, Lord, in the manger. This is what happened. It was, it was quantum physics day. <laughs> <laughs> and they sang you two. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Because he's an engineer. And so he's like, well, they didn't get all that quantum stuff right, but you can go. <laughs> I've been going two years, honey. <laughs> so it worked out. So, um, so I found my home. And I found that balance between intellect and spirit. And um, experience and academics. And I took every class in the region. And I kept asking everybody about that Christ within thing. Tell me about that Christ within thing. I want to know more about that. 
And so it became such a game changer for me. I mean, no longer is God this magical Santa Claus. He's not this judge that we are to please and appease. He's not, you know, defined by the church, by man, and here's the books that tell you everything man said about him, and that's your answer. He wasn't any of those things. Couldn't be intellectually understood, couldn't even be held in the human mind, all that is there. And those were all steps along the path, and every single one of them was my holy ground because that's what I was ready for at that time. And I'm still ready for more. Oh, please, show me more, right? So during one of my last classes at Unity Village with Paul Hasselbeck, my understanding of God evolved even more. I can now say the first principle of unity with belief, no matter what I see in the world, God is good and God is all. I could say it, you know, I could get through it, but in my mind's going, yeah, but what about, you know, in every class I've taught, someone said, yeah, what about Hitler? You know, it's always the, how can you explain that if God is all and God is good? How many here still struggle with that? Yeah, I mean, at times, right? We still do. You know, the kids say God is all, active in everything and everywhere. And, you know, we say there is one presence and power in the universe, God the good. And that doesn't leave room for this other thing that we're experiencing. And so it's a quandary. But what I learned through Paul is that active, animating, creating energy exists through us. We are the creators. If there is to be God here, if there is to be good here, it is ours to do. It is ours to do. So what's all this have to do about Moses? <laughs> well, metaphorically, everyone in the Bible is us. If you read it and put yourself in place in the Bible, it will speak to you through time and distance and history. <clears throat> Metaphorically, Moses is us. So I heard that word holy and I loved it. Like I said, it resonated something in me because I think that story is about awakening. And that has been my journey since I was five years old to awaken, to know truth. And so when Moses is watching the sheep and he sees the light, that's his awakening. There's lights around you all the time. There's books in Goodwill that call your name. There's people that stand in front of you with a lesson for you. But you must see it. You must be open to it. Moses was open to it. He saw the light and he went to the light. When he awakened, he was on holy ground. And if you awaken, you can never go back. Amen? Amen. 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 You cannot go back. Your shoes are off the rest of your life. Right? And so he had to climb the mountain. Metaphysically, that means a higher state of consciousness. We are all seeking that higher state of consci consciousness. We have to rise to meet God. He rose to meet God. Just as I did along and along my journey, becoming more aware of aspects of God as I went along. The thing that about taking your shoes off, it's not just that you're on holy ground, but you're to have nothing between you and your journey to seek God's face. Materialism, relationships that don't build you or feed you. Anything that's between you and your spiritual path and your spiritual journey needs to be removed. Let nothing be between you and your God. The bush did not burn. It was not consumed, but it was lit. Just like divine energy 
It purifies, it sanctifies, it enlivens, illuminates, but does not diminish. Just like the light of God, it makes you stronger, bigger, better, more loving, more imaginative, wiser. That's what the burning bush was. All of those 12 powers in that burning bush were lit from Moses to complete his task. Just as they're available, born into you already, the day you came on this plane, it is there. You just have to look and let it call you and remove all obstacles, all sandals in your life to see and grasp the illumination they're ready for you. So that message about holy ground leaves us with some questions. Are you seeing the burning bush in front of you? When you see the bush, do you go? Or you say, I'll do that tomorrow. No. Do you go investigate? Are you open for the next unveiling of the beautiful divine? Is there anything between you and your higher self or your higher work that needs to be removed? Have you sat in stillness and listened to spirit and heard your task for today, for the moment, for your life? And lastly, do you understand your part in God's name? Because Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am the I am. I am the I am. Another translation that's come out recently is I will be what I will be. Now that certainly speaks to us as creator, doesn't it? It isn't done yet. We're still creating. We are the creators. And we still have work to do. And you all are. You're here today. You're seeking. You're looking. You're open. And I invite you to really embrace that, if you want to call it co-creation with God, or if you're fully in oneness consciousness, that we all are God. And Jesus said that. Don't you know, for ye all are gods. So the question is, is how will you express God today? And, I, you know, I struggled with the name of this little topic. Leslie Sue said I had to title it. <laughs> I do what I'm told most days. <laughs> so I, I first said, well, the evolution of God. I'm like, oh, I said, what's the evolution? No, let's see. It's my understanding of God. No, that's not it. The evolution of my understanding of God. <laughs> you know, and finally, I just said, you know, it's about holy ground. Let's just call it holy ground. But I like that idea of spiritual evolution because I think it means we grow and expand and we come closer to the truth as we go along, if you're willing. Have you met people who are done? They're just not willing. I don't hang with them too much. <laughs> so that, that idea of God within, that God as a life-giving, creative energy from which all things manifest from the field of unlimited potential. When God said we are created in his image, he didn't mean a little bit. We are created in God's image because he gave himself into a thousand million trillion pieces and we are all it. We are it. So I have a treat for us. Um, there's a song that encapsulates this perfectly and I want to tell you a story. You know him, Bob Simon. I spent a week in, uh, last summer, he did the Youth Summer Connections. Um, totally fell in love with him, as we all do. And there's a song he told a story about. It's called The Same Energy. And um, there was a young boy in Ireland that was accidentally shot by an Irish soldier in the head and became instantly blind. 
and unconscious, and he went to the hospital, and when he awoke, a couple of days later, he said, what happened? And they said, you were shot by an iron soldier. And the little boy said, oh, it must be awful to be that soldier. Bring him to me. He must feel awful. And so they did. And they became friends. And that's the idea, is if you're putting forth that kind of love in the world, people notice. So the Dalai Lama came to Ireland, and you know, when he when he does a gig, 30, 50,000 people, you know, he says, I don't want that chair right there to be that little boy, because he's hurt. And before he did a thing, the Dalai Lama came in, down the stairs, right to the boy, and said, someday, I want to be like you. And this is the song. So we'll do it as a meditation.
take a moment to let that energy vibrate in you because it's there, baby. It's there. So we're just going to take a moment. Shoes off. Breath relaxed. And focus on our heart space. And just allow an opening. With each breath in, you can think love. And with each breath out, you can think peace. We breathe in love. We breathe out peace. we return back from that lovely divine place of peace may I say to you that I wish for you that your shoes always be off that your heart always be open that you're allowing the energy to be matching your intention and that you know that you are not just love you are love. Thank you. Thank you. And I think what Elizabeth is saying is that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And I'm so glad I wore my special socks today. I didn't know I was going to take my shoes off. <laughs>